Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, I'm sorry if uh, not all of you enjoyed the game. I thought it would be pretty fun, pretty messy, and it was pretty messy. Yeah, I didn't like right, it. I'm going to figure it out later if the mess doesn't get worse. What? Nothing. Okay. So don't make, don't make a bigger mess, Tyler. Right. Yeah, Tyler. met before, uh, oh, no. it's probably true because I'm like out uh, talk much to a lot of people. But my name is Paul Rudolph and I am like so very, maybe excited, maybe excited that you're all here today. Maybe, I can't tell. So on typical Sunday morning, our youth pastor Drew Hefty is about this tall, maybe, uh, not that tall. He's the one who's usually giving this message. Right now he is in Portland, Oregon. Friends in the back, you know what? He asked me to do the message this week. I said, yeah, I told you. He asked me a while ago. So I kind of remember what I was doing today. Um, uh, during this message, I would like I would like to ask a favor of all of you. Um, just uh, during this time, just remember to that God, hopefully this is God's message that he's speaking through me. Hopefully that God does speak through me. Each Sunday that you guys come back to, hopefully you remember that God is the one trying to share this message with you all. And I hope you guys remember that for every Sunday to come. All right, uh, right now I'm going to pray us in. So please quiet down, bow your heads, bow your hands, bow your eyes. Uh, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing all of us here today. I thank you for the fun time we had with the funny videos, the game, and the worship, Lord. Uh, it's just so awesome to worship you and to speak the truth about you, God. And I pray that during this time, uh, these words that come out of my mouth are words of, that are your words, and I'm just the vessel delivering the message. God, I just pray that this time as well. I thank you today for everything you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So usually what I've noticed is that uh, pastors, any kind of pastor, does a funny story beforehand, so I have a funny story. Yeah. So back when I was in eighth grade, we had our Magic Mountain trip at the end of the school year. And back to that, I still hated it. I always hated roller coasters. I always hated it. But I thought, you know what? I don't know. Turn it off. Uh, so um, I, I didn't like roller coasters, but I thought, you know, I'll just go anyway. So I went, I had a good time. Uh, the only two rides I went on were Gold Rusher and Ninja. So, <laughs> Good lunch, so I did not get good lunch. I went and I found this place that had like garlic knots. So I had like a plateful of like garlic knots, devoured it. And then, then, and then <laughs> that's a bad idea. And it was a it wait, wait for it. It was, it was a great idea, not really. So after that, after I devoured a whole plateful of like garlic knots, I went on Ninja like five times in a row. So no one else was going on Ninja. No one else that day. Uh, so I kept going on a uh, That's a lame ride. Uh, uh, but I, I, I get motion sickness, and I didn't really think about it at the time. But like after I went on Ninja a few more times, like I wasn't feeling so good. So for the rest of the day, I was just laying down, like, trying to like make myself feel better. Um, and so we get to that time where we all have to go on the bus. I'm just like, oh, I'm not, oh, I don't know if I can make it. So I walk onto the bus. I take two steps forward. I'm like, roll. Put my mouth. Like, work. I go. There's people all around me. So I turn left to an empty seat. Throw up all over the bus seats. Like, everywhere. Uh, no one, thankfully, got splashed. Those the splash zone. Thank goodness. But I did throw up all the bus. The bus was delayed for probably half an hour because I had to clean up my mess. So I go back outside. I lay down. Like the like the vice principal. I'm talking to. Hey, can you make him a Maybe he's like, well, if you can't, you have to wait here for your parents. But, okay, I'll just go on the bus. So on the bus, I didn't throw up again. But like, the very, like, I was expecting that entire week to go on my like, the school. Everyone's going to be laughing at me. It's going to be terrible. I get there. No one cares. No one even, like, remembered. The only thing I ever heard about was from my friends who, like, knew who was there with me. And then, like, the people 
uh, there's two guys in my gym class who sit right in front of me. They're like, hey, you hear about that, that guy that threw up on the bus? Like, yeah, it's gross. And nobody knows me. No one knows me. I guess I was just invisible. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm not, like, I was like, hey, it was me. I threw up. I was not about that. I was like, yes, they don't know it's me. So I was just nice and quiet about it. But it was a bad day in my life. But ever since then, I'm like, I've been a little bit better at like, being okay and embarrassing myself. So I'll probably do like some stuff out in public without really caring, because like, who cares? I threw up on a bus before. It was a pretty bad day. Alright, so we've been doing this series called Nuggets of Truth. And so, uh, today uh, I, I chose the topic of why does God let bad things happen? Which when I was in middle school, and like, ever since middle school or whatever, I've always thought, like, why does God let bad things happen. Why does all this stuff happen in the world that's bad? Um, so it's everywhere. Everyone has bad things happen to them. But like, why does God let it happen? That was my question. So I thought, you know what? I'll look in the Bible and see what I can come up with. And hopefully, God showed it to me. And I think um, God's going to do a good time in this place. So, we're going to be talking about why does God let bad things happen. And we're not going to be sticking with one story of the Bible. I'm going to go through a few of them. Uh, short little glimpses. Hopefully, I can get through fast. And not like 30 minutes of me just talking about one story. So the first guy we're going to be looking at is a guy called Job. And if you don't know who Job is, he was a very faithful man. He had uh, a few kids. He had like a huge farm. He had a very nice life for the time that he was living in the Bible. Like, he didn't have like, video games or smartphones. But back then, he was pretty wealthy. And he was very faithful to God. He never did any mistakes. He always repented. He always offered to God. He always did the right thing. Never once did he like fail or like lose faith in God. So one day, um, God is uh, surrounded uh, he's, uh, in a company of angels, and this one guy named Satan walks up to God, and, he, and God says to Satan, "Look at my servant Job. He's very faithful." So God is basically bragging about this guy named Job, and Satan's like, "With will, not this." Thank you. <laughs> and God's like, so Satan, so God said he's bragging about Job. And Satan's like, this guy's only doing it because he's getting stuff out of it. This guy's like working the system. And so God's like, all right, what do you want? And Satan's like, all right, if you let me like hurt Job, I'll show you that he is not faithful. And guess what God did? He allowed Satan to hurt Job. So Job lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his livestock. He lost his house. And uh, the only thing that, he, that could not happen to Job was his life. He was not allowed to be killed by Satan. So like, Satan like, made him like, super sick. So he had like, gross like, pores and like, pus yeah. all over him. He looked bald. He was super gross. That's what Satan did. So Satan took everything from him. In the beginning, Job was still remaining faithful to God. He was still like, praising God. But then a few chapters into the book of Job, Job starts to lash out. Like, God, why would you do this? Why are you so unjust? Because to Job, he, is, he's, he knows he's done nothing wrong. And this, is, this bad stuff is happening to him. And he is like super angry at God. And then uh, during the book of Job, he has a few friends come over to see how he's doing. And they keep saying, this is what you must have done wrong. They keep like, throughout the entire book, like, you must have done this, you must have done this. You did that wrong. And Job's like, I didn't do any of that. And uh, near the end of the book, there's another friend that was with him that wasn't really talking the entire time. And he starts to speak up. It's like, you guys are both wrong. Uh, like he was calling out both the friends and Job. And the very end of the book of Job, God responds to Job. You know, we'll see that in a bunch of today, but God responded directly to Job in the form of a storm cloud. So you guys imagine a cloud up there, but imagine like lightning and rain and it's huge and dark. And talking to you. A cloud talking to you. Imagine that. So God responds to Job, uh, and he responds to him for a few chapters asking him questions. Let me see if we can find where those questions are. Yes. Here we are. It's uh, Job verses 38, verses 4 through 5. And, asked, and God asked this. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. This is from Job uh, 38, verses 4 through 5. So this goes from the beginning of chapter 38 all the way to chapter 41. But God is asking Job these questions. Of like, do you understand like, what I can do? And at the end of this, Job says, uh, in chapter 42, Job says, Surely I spoke of things I do not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. So, Job, 
Job um, understood that he didn't understand. So it's weird, it's weird saying that, uh, but Job understood that like he can't imagine, like, picture like what's like what God's I guess like will is like. We're people. We can think of what people do. We can't think of what God can do. Like God, like we can't say God's unjust because like God is so complicated that we can't even question God's power and ability and wisdom and all that. So Job, at the very end of the book, is in a state of humility. Throughout the entire book, like most of the book, he was angry at God and called him unjust for all the things he's done to him. At the end of the book, Job realized that he shouldn't be angry with God and that he does not. He understands. He doesn't understand what God is and like what God can do. So after that, he starts going back to being faithful again, realizing that he was foolish for being angry at God. And after this, something surprising happens. So um, what happens is that God gives twice of everything back to Job. And the reason it's surprising is because Job didn't get it back because it was a test. He didn't get it back because he remained faithful at the end with God. It wasn't like, okay, Job, you passed. Here you go. Here's twice of everything. That, that's not why. What? He got, he got uh, I don't know if it's the exact thing, but he got, um, he got sons and daughters. He got twice of everything back. Two, yeah, so you got two families. You got two families. No, I don't think so, but he got like he got his like life back. Basically, all the sickness was gone, and but he remained faithful. But the reason he got it back is because God decided to. Like he didn't earn it. It was God's what? Oh. It was God's will. God decided. You know what? I'm just going to give this I'm gonna give twice of it back to you. We don't know why. We don't know why this happened, but God decided to do it. So a terrible thing happened to Job. Job's life was basically taken away, but he was still living. But God decided that, you know what, I'm going to give everything back to you. And Job realized after that that no matter how many bad things happen in life, he will always remain faithful to God. And that's sort of like, I don't have, I don't have points today, I don't have a big idea, but something to remember is that when things get bad, things like bad, like maybe, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you're in the ball and your whole family goes away. Dies. Yeah. But like say like you get a bad brain, um, don't think like feel like your life's terrible. Just like stay with God and be faithful in Him. That's what Job did. And Job, it took him a while to remember that. It took him a while to go through all this hardship that Satan put him through, God put him through, basically God allowed Satan to do it. it. It took him a while to remain faithful again. And that was only the first example of today. Alright, second example. And I talked about this, the second story I talked about a while ago at the beginning of summer in, my, in the previous message, um, but I think it definitely applies to this topic. And it's about a, a very, like, a story that people don't really talk about in church, uh, but I really like it. It's called The Shunammite Woman, or Shunammite, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, basically, there's this woman who lives with her husband in this town, and this prophet Elisha, you got the friends Elisha, that's S H A. Elisha, he comes to the town very often. And this woman's like, you know what? He comes here so often that I'm going to build him a room, build him like a room on top of the house. So this woman builds it. And this prophet Elisha is like, you've been so kind to me. What is it that you want? So this prophet's trying to give her something like out of like, in return of like her good grace. And uh, she's really saying, they found out from a servant that she can't have children, but she's always wanted a son. And so he's like, all right, in a year's time, you will have a son. And so in a year's time, she had a son. And a few years went by, the boy grew, and they were happy. But one day, the son had a headache, some sort of headache. He went to his father, and the dad's like, go to your mom. And so the son went to his mom, uh, laid down in her lap, and died. So this, this gift from God that the woman got, that was directed, because she couldn't have children, but it was given to her, she saw it grow into his, uh, her son, and then she saw, it die, she saw him die right in front of her. And her reaction wasn't like, she wasn't, she didn't like start crying, but I not say that. What happened was she quickly went to a horse, got on the horse, and rode it all the way to Elisha to find Elisha. She went to him, and he, and he says, I don't think I wrote this down, but he says, um, take my staff, go to your son and put it on him. But then she says this in 2 Kings verse, chapter 4, verse 30, four, verse, verse 30, sorry. She says this, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed him. So they get back to her son, and Elisha prays and brings the boy back to life. 
So the story does have a good ending, sort of like this movie with Joe, there's a good ending. Uh, but she did still lose her son. And I know none of us are parents in the room. Um, but just imagine having a child and watching that child die right in front of you. Like, that sucks. Like, I know we're not parents. That's gonna suck to see your child, who you seen grow up, die right in front of you. But so the thing to remember is her reaction. She didn't go crazy about it. And when she went to see Elisha, she didn't immediately just go back with the staff. She decided, to, she says this, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So she is sticking with the Lord through this hard time. This bad thing that's happened to her, she's trying to stay with the Lord, with God. And so then uh, she sticks with God, and then God uh, brings her son back to life. That's a good ending. Um, but then when I was reading this, I wanted to get more context on who Elisha, the prophet, was. So I went back to the beginning of 2 Kings, and I found something fantastic. So we're going to get talking about that right now. And it says this. Elisha, oh, oh, before we get to the verse, so Elisha was still a servant following of the prophet Elijah. Elisha, Elijah, it's it confusing me too. So in 2 Kings chapter 2, it starts, it starts off saying how Elijah, the prophet at that point, is going to be taken to heaven, he's going to die. And the people all around knew this. So the people that Elisha and Elisha were seeing kept asking Elisha, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? That's in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 3. And Elisha's response is this, yes, I know, but do not speak of it. So it's kind of, it's kind of like you have like a really good friend that you look up to, and you know they're going to die, or you know someone that they're going to die. You, kind of, you don't want to talk about it. Like you don't want to think about when they're going to die. You just want to spend as much time with them as possible. And that's what happens here. Elisha, Elijah, prophet, uh, he keeps going to, from town to town to town. And each time he's like, Elisha, I need you to stay, I need you to stay here, stay behind. And every single time Elisha says this, we're responding by saying, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. That is what stood out to me. I'm like, wow, this is two different times with Elisha. Awesome. And Elisha, Elisha knew that his master was going to be taken from him. So he did not want to leave his side. He wanted to stay alive as much as possible. And knowing what is going to happen to him must have been really hard. Like, just imagining, knowing that you love someone, and knowing that they're going to die. Like, I, don't, I guess you don't have to answer this. Like, is it worse to, like, like find out someone's going to die and know about it? Or is it worse to find that they're already dead? You don't have to answer this. It's a question for yourself. I think they're both pretty bad, or pretty sad. Um, but it, it actually happened. So Elijah was taken in right in front of Elisha. It was taken right from him up to heaven. And after this, Elisha was filled with the spirit of Elijah and kept doing his work as a prophet. So Elisha was very sad at that time, but he kept doing the work that Elijah started him on doing. And so both of these stories with Elisha, we see the same line about not leaving the Lord. Both times it talks about Elisha staying with the Lord, which is also with uh, Elijah. It talks about the Shunammite woman staying with Elisha, who was with the Lord, because the Lord was there, there with both of them. So, in hard times, we do need to we do need to be with God. Stick with God all the time. Even when bad things happen, or we know that they're going to happen, we cannot abandon the Lord. All these people we have seen are people just like us. We're people, uh, the Shunammite woman, Elisha, Elijah, Job, we're all people. We're all fully human. They don't have some supernatural ability that makes them okay with bad things happening. And we're the same. We're just like that. So we are humans. But each person so far that I've talked about has remained with God, even if one of them so, took a while to realize this, took a while to get there. Now for my last example, the last person we'll be looking at, and this guy is a big deal, huge deal. This guy's name is Jesus Christ. Whoa! Right as much as I realized, Jesus had a hard time. He had a really hard time. He had a, bad, a lot of bad things happen to him. So, um, who knows who Jesus is? Raise your hand. Wow. Me. Does anyone know what happened to him? Dad. Me. Oh, what happened? What happened to Jesus? Uh, he suffered on the cross for our sins. Yeah. So we know that Jesus suffered on the cross. And you guys know how cow he was attached to the cross? By the Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's still, it's still, a huge, huge nails stuck into his body. Now, for example, say I brought a hammer and a huge nail. Who wants to put me a hand? Oh, me. Okay, no, I'm just joking. I'm not going to hammer nail. No, I'm serious. But think about it. That must have been painful <laughs> to get a nail hammered through your skin and held up to, like, a cross. So that one's not a cross. 
But man, look, I'm being hanged from like nails piercing through me. That's painful. Oh, never mind. None of us have ever experienced that kind of pain. That is painful. We're not there yet. Uh, so before we get before Jesus is crucified on the cross, guys in the back, please calm down. You guys are just being very much. Oh, please calm down. I'm very sorry. It's okay. So before Jesus died on the cross, like right before, like very soon before, um, he was taken and he was flogged. It says here in Matthew 27, verse 26. Go back to chapter 27, verse 26. It says this. Um, then he released Bar 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 Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Who knows what it means to be flogged? Oh, I know. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so oh, flogging I is like whipping. However, in, in the whip, there's sharp thorns, there's pieces of sharp glass, anything you can imagine that's sharp. And so what happened is, they would whip the person, so a normal whip just hit them and come back. The flogging whip would hit them, get stuck in their back, and then they would have to pull out, pull back, and it would rip flesh off. And then this one, they did it a few times. So like his whole back was just ruined. 47. 47? 40? 40 times it happened. So imagine getting flogged 40 times. Did you be living? I would. I would be dead. But so then right after he got flogged, friends, right after he was flogged, he was sent with soldiers, he was spit on, he was mocked, and he never did anything wrong. Remember this guy's Jesus? Never did, did anything wrong. He was perfect. He was the son of God. Never did anything wrong. And this stuff still happened. So, he was God's son, and God let this bad thing happen. Jesus was mocked, spit on by soldiers, and then he was crucified right after that. And while hanging from the cross, which is extremely painful because we talked about the whole details in the body, ouch, don't want to ever that happen to me. He, um, another verse uh, happens in Matthew 27, verse 26, and it says this. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, I don't know how to pronounce that, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Matthew 27, verse 26. Jesus, I'll think about it, nine hours of being held up to a cross with nails. Pain. Just think about that. Okay. I don't um, want to think about that. Yeah, you don't want to think about that. But Jesus says, in this verse, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is asking the very same question, why would God let this bad thing happen? But we know why though we know why this happens. Most of us know. We know that Jesus dies for us because that is what God sent him here to do. Jesus died on the cross because God told him to. God made him for that reason. God loves us so much that he would let this terrible thing, terrible, terrible thing, happen to his own perfect son. He let his son die. God did this to save who? Who did God do to save? All of you, me, everyone. God has saved everyone. This bad thing happened, it turned into a very, very good thing. God loves everyone. And he would do anything to save all of us, including letting his son die and come back to life. Now, I'm sure that all of us have been through something bad in our lives, but we don't need to get into specific stories. We don't need to do that. But maybe you had a friend move away. Maybe you got into a fight with a very good friend. Or maybe you lost someone you love, like a grandparent, a parent, a friend, a brother, a sister, or a pet. Um, we have all had something bad happen to us. And God, it's always going to happen. Bad things are always going to happen. Instead of being angry at God, like Job was at the beginning, we need to understand that we will never, we need to understand that we will never understand God's plan for us. So God has this amazing plan that we have no idea what's going to happen. We have no idea what's going to happen. But God does have a plan for us. So let's say flying cars. Um, everything that happens, happens for a reason. Bad or good, it happens for a reason. Good things and bad things happen. And that is, God, that is through God's wisdom. We don't know why it happens. We don't know what God's thinking. But God lets it happen. God lets these bad things happen because he loves us and wants us to overcome and continue to follow him through the hard times. So when bad things happen to us, guys, we need to like hold on tight 
like um, the Shunai woman, and Elisha, and Jesus. We have to hold on tight and then Job eventually. We have to hold on tight with God, knowing that life is going to punch us, beat us up, till we get on our knees on the ground, we're bleeding down. Life is going to beat us up. And that's Satan. Satan's going to beat us up. But God is going to use that in some way for good. Sometime, sometime later in your life, who knows, maybe it's tomorrow, a few years from now, who knows? God is going to use the bad things that happen in your life for something good. We don't know what's going to be. We don't know what God's plan is, but God does have a plan. So if you want to leave here today with a big idea, or here's a main point, I don't have one of those. I love you again. I don't have one of those. What I do have is this. Never leave the Lord. When things suck, and you think that the world hates you, seek God and ask for wisdom. God loves you and has a plan, just like I said. We just don't understand it yet, and we probably never will. Don't give in to anger, and don't think that God has abandoned you like a lost sheep. We are his sheep. Yeah. Has he is a plan for you? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Maybe this is it right now. I honestly, I, it's like, it's a plan. It's, I think God's plan isn't going to be like a one and done thing. I think it's going to be a continuous thing that's going to affect people for a long time. So maybe his plan is uh, you making a relationship with someone who is a, maybe a bad person, but because they're friends with you, they come to know God. That is one part of God's plan for you, maybe. So maybe God's used to, I have no idea. I honestly don't know. But to remain in that faith, knowing that we don't know what God has in store, that is like true faith right there. And that's what God loves, is the faith. So give us free will. So going back to this, don't give in to anger, and don't think that God is a man the lost you. And because we are his sheep. If you guys don't know, we are his sheep. And he is our shepherd. You might not like to hear this stuff we bad things happen, but it's true. Bad things happen to everyone, even the good people, like Job. You are all loved, even if you don't see it. And please, if you are really having a bad time, and bad things keep happening to you, find someone you can really trust and talk with them about them. And that might even be God. I talk about God all the time. It feels so good. Don't think that the world is out to get you, because that's what it feels like. I know. I also want to say that I'm sorry for those of you who have had a hard life, but know this. Know that God has a plan for each and every one of you, no matter who you are or what you've done. All right? Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to end our time in prayer. If you have any questions, please ask me at the end. Thank you. All right. Jesus, thank you for this time you've given me. I pray that these words I've spoken are your words and your words alone. I pray that we can all leave here knowing that when bad things happen, which they are going to happen, God, I just pray that we can remember to remain faithful in you. There's so many examples in the Bible like that, that are there. There's so many in account. God, I just pray that we can look back to them and use them and realize we have to remain faithful in you. Never be angry at you. You are just so amazing that we can't even understand. So I pray that as we leave this room that we can try to seek you in the relationship that you want us to have with God. And just thank you so much. I pray for everyone in this room right now. That they will get to know you and love you so much. God, thank you again for everything you've done and you're going to do with us. God, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.